So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my talk is a very practical talk. It's about um, how we go about from start to finish performing the cardiac examination, including a calcium scoring scan, um, and about how prepare, to prepare the patient um, from a radiographer's perspective, obviously. Um, the most important thing I would say to, for you to take back, especially if your centre is not doing this at the moment already, is uh, that patient pa uh, preparation is absolutely paramount. It's the most important part of the whole examination. If your patient doesn't understand what they need to do for you, the test you get will be um, pretty poor. Okay, So it's really important that from the minute they arrive in the department, they're given confidence and reassurance by all the staff that they see and that they are prepared and explained the procedure adequately so that they can perform for us in order for us to get decent images. So. So here are two examples of um, the type of scans we're going to perform. So on the left you've got the calcium scoring scan, which is going to be obviously a non-contrast scan to give us a, a scoring of calcium loading in vessels. It's obviously ECG gated to reduce patient movement, um, but obviously has no contrast so, and no other drugs. So it's a very simple diagnostic test that most centres will run through so, uh, areas such as rapid access chest pain clinics. We can do these as a walk-in service if necessary. And then we've got the CT coronary angiogram on the right, which obviously is also ECG gated for movement, but also will involve giving of drugs, beta blockade, GTN and IV contrast to the patient. <coughs> so the patient positioning on the scanner is quite important. Um, we want a good ECG trace. So we want the patients well prepared before they come into the scan room. So if we've got a waiting time or a patient, a lot of patients in the waiting room, we may give oral beta blockade beforehand for them to sit and have that beforehand. Or we may just get them all prepared in the waiting room, in the pre pre preparation room. They need a cannula, they need to be changed so we can access their chest, and they need to have the procedure explained to them. Um, because most of the patients that are coming for this type of test are going to be very anxious. They're not going to hear you the first time you tell them, so they need to have this repeated to them over and over again. And by the time you get them on the scanner, they should have a pretty good understanding of what's going to happen to them. So, you want a nice good ECG? So it's important to have your ECG leads placed nicely. So it's quite good to put, position the leads while the patient's arms are in the scanning position. So arms above the head, um, legs comfortable and relaxed, patient comfortable and warm on the table, um, and ECG obviously away from the neck, uh, away from any pacemakers you might have, um, and good connection. So we do prep the skin with new prep and shave if necessary. Get really good ECG trace because it will save you a lot of hassle later on. So. This is what we'd like to see on the monitor, a nice regular good R wave, flat TP interval, and a uh, nice regular rhythm. What it's more like in most cases, um, a bit erratic, um, patient a little bit anxious, they might not be very comfortable, they're having a bit of fidget. So we need to let them settle, put the ECG leads on quite early on and let the patient settle down on the scanner so that they, the, the, the trace generally tends to flatten out by the time you're ready to scan. Um, you need to look at that. If it's not settling, are, do your leads need repositioning? Um, uh, is the ECG monitor reading the T waves? Do you need to change the size or your display on your monitor? And is this interference or heart movement? Is everything plugged in properly so you're not getting any electrical interference? Um, everything, everything like that will be dependent on your own machine. Your, your, your own machine and equipment will have its own little foibles, which I'm sure the engineers can explain to you. So you may need to change the lead selection. We tend to use lead two, tends to give us the best... Um, trace but it does vary per patient and make sure there's no muscle tremor so the most important thing and the thing I try to instill in the new new staff that are coming through is about having the arms supported it's really important they're going to be in there for 10 to 15 minutes by the time you've fiddled around and planned everything so they need to be comfortable and they need to have their arms supported it's quite hard to lay on your back with your arms up above your head for a long period of time without they getting muscle tremor so it's really important to make sure the patients are comfortable and if necessary, consider moving your ECG position, move them more centrally or move them further away, move them across to, towards the, the armpits, just get them where you can get a really good trace. You can post-process your ECG if you really can't get anything better, but it's better to start with a better ECG than have to fiddle with it afterwards. So contrast. You need a pump injector that can inject two uh, syringes at once. It needs to have a license to do mixed contrast saline injection 
um, and you need to be able to inject at a fast flow rate. Your patient needs to have a pink or green cannula as standard. It needs to be no less than a 20 gauge cannula because you want to be injecting anywhere between four and six mils a second and at a PSI of about 325. So it needs, it's a high pressure, high speed injection. So it needs a really good, really sturdy cannula. And you need to use low osmolar contrast, so 350 or 370 milligrams for viodine per mil. The idea of the saline chase um, is to push the contrast through, reduces the streaking in the SVC and helps to compact the initial bolus. We use a, a, mix, a, a pure contrast followed by a mixed contrast saline flush um, and that just helps to fill the peripheral vessels. So our goal for optimal opacification is to achieve homogeneous optimal opacification of the coronary arteries, the left ventricle and the thoracic aorta and then a reasonable contrast of the right ventricle for assessment and then for some triple rule outs when you get they want everything in one scan as we often know people ask for cardiologists being the worst um, we then have to try and get a good image of the pulmonary trunks as well so you need to adapt your, your, your um, injection protocol depending on what you're trying to look at but obviously for a cardiac scan you're really trying to look at the coronaries and left ventricle and thoracic aorta the best so achieving optimal opacification is, is dependent on a number of factors. So the flux, so the rate by concentration, so we've talked about the concentration, it needs to be at least 350 milligrams of iodine per mil, and your rate of contrast injection really needs to be no less than about five mils a second for good opacification. Patient's body weight and their BMI is going to have a, an effect. You get increased noise in larger patients, therefore you need an increased flux. So for patients over 100 kilos, we routinely put an 18 gauge cannula in and inject at six mils a second um, in order to get good, good opacification. Obviously circulation time. A lot of patients we're gonna be doing these cardiac scans on are elderly, they're frail, they may have valve disease, um, and so their cardiac output is going to be affected. So it's important to know all these clinical indications before we scan so that we can take them into consideration. And obviously the volume that we inject is gonna depend on your scanner speed, the protocol that you're scanning, so whether you're needing to include the aortic arch, whether you're doing graft studies and need to go higher up in the chest, or whether you're just doing native heart. So there's a number of different um, protocols out there. We're, we're still, our scanner was put in in May, June time, so we're still tweaking and optimising our protocols. So we, we, on some patients, use a biphasic protocol, where we give a, a pure contrast injection followed by a second phase of saline or we use a sort of biphasic, triphasic, where we give um, pure contrast followed by a mix, <coughs> maybe followed by a saline chase just to help compact all that through. And obviously we're giving roughly 95 mils to most patients. I'm sure that will decrease over time. Now when we get used to our scanner, I'm sure we can start decreasing our volumes. We've already decreased it from the old scanner to the new scanner. I'm sure we can get that lower again on most of our native hearts, but certainly our, our TAVIs and stuff have come down considerably from about 150 mils to about 100 mils per patient. So the faster the scanner, the less contrast we can use. So prepare your patient. They need to know about the breath holding that we need them to do. So we ask them to take a medium sized breath, preferably through their nose or open mouth so they don't valsalva. We don't want them to valsalva because obviously it affects the venous return and um, it causes in increased intrathoracic pressure. It reduces the contrast enhancement um, to a minimum as well, so you want to keep that down, but the importance of them taking a, a, a gentle breath in. They don't need to take a big breath in. We're not looking at their lungs. We don't need full lung volumes. We're looking at the heart. We want their chest to stay still. So that's all we need to explain to them. A lot of our patients are also thoracic patients, so they might have difficulty holding their breath. It's really good to assess the patient's breath holding ability um, during the uh, before you scan because you need to they need to know that they're going to be able to manage it and also if we, we also advise them that if they can't hold their breath for the length of time of the scan that they need to let it out very very gently as if they're whistling and then not try not to take another breath in until the scanner says breathe normally most patients can manage it but we do get an odd few that are, uh, have lots of lung problems so a lot of our lung transplant patients may struggle with this so it's important they know they don't need to take a very big breath in practice with them so they know what to expect we've got lovely little flashing lights on our scanner that nice little pac-man faces that we can practice so they even if, they, even if their english is not great they can see the, the lights they know when to hold their breath and breathe in make sure they can hold for the duration we've discussed that make sure that the ecg signal is good when they're holding their breath 
it's no good at having a lovely signal and then they hold their breath because they bring their shoulders up or something else and you suddenly get a rubbish um, tray. So make sure everything is fine before you continue. And as I said at the beginning, you need staff around you that even if they're new and they don't know what they're doing, they need to be able to ooze confidence and reassurance. These patients are anxious. They think they're about to have a heart attack. They think their heart is going to explode on them. They, they don't know what to expect. They're really, really anxious. So it's really important that the staff that are dealing with them are calm and reassuring all the time and make them comfortable. So starting the scan. So we start with a topogram. Depending on what we're going to um, scan, we may need to start a little higher on the, the top of the chest. If we're scanning grass, we want to do the whole chest. So topogram or scalp, depending on what your manufacturer is. We want to go to the apex of the heart. So we scan for native hearts from the level of the carina to the bottom, inferior border of the apex of the heart. So our calcium scoring scan is 120 kV, irrespective. Um, the MA is modified depending on the patient's size. All our cardiac protocols are modified by patient weight and BMI. Slice thickness is quite thick, 2.5s. Rotation time of 0.35 seconds and a breath hold time of around 10 to 15 seconds. So the, the, cardiac, the calcium scoring scan actually takes longer than the angiogram in most cases because it's prospective, it's step and shoot. So actually if they can hold their breath for the calcium scoring part of the scan, they'll easily hold their breath for the angiogram. So we've said it's about step and shoot, take a scan, move, take, the table moves, scan again, table moves. So each, every other heartbeat we're, we're scanning. <coughs> and we're imaging di primarily through mid-diastole, roughly 70 to 75% of the, the cycle. Um, it can be modified on the patient's heart rate at the time, certain scans, so on our old Toshiba scanner, we had this table, we used to modify the cardiac phase trigger depending on the patient's heart rate. The newer scanner tends to be a little bit more um, sensible, it measures it itself and works it out, so it's, it's pretty good. But yes, we're, you're looking for mid-diastole in most cases. You're going to scan on a, a, reconstruct on a small field of view, so they're set at 25 centimetres. This improves the spatial resolution. You want to be able to see the small structures and differentiate between neighbouring structures. You're looking at small vessels, so you need a good spatial resolution. And we, re we regularly reconstruct both on a cardiac kernel, obviously to look at the ca uh, cardiac arteries, but we also look at the lungs. So we, we scan out and reconstruct through the lung fields that we have scanned through. Because there may be lung respiratory reason for their chest pain may not be cardiac, it may be something else in the chest. So we don't scan the whole chest, but we do at least look at the lungs that we've scanned through, just as a backup. So for native heart, we continue, we scan roughly the level of the carina to the apex of the heart. If you have done a calcium scoring scan beforehand, you can obviously use that to help narrow down your angiogram scan. So we can reduce the dose to the patient further. And we're going to get nice images, hold breath hold all the way from above the LAD all the way to the apex of the heart. For bypass grafts, we like to go to above mid clavicles to the base of the heart so that we get any lemma or rema grafts that are seen there and obviously we get to look at the subclavians as well. So depending on the patient's body weight and BMI, we scan between 80 and 120 kV and between roughly 250 and 350 MA. Um, our slice thickness on our GE scanner is 0.625 and um, the slice increment is about 0.3. Rotation time, 0.25 to 0.35, depending on your scanner. And the breath hold time, I'd say it's less than that for native hearts. It's about eight, eight seconds for native heart, up to 15, 20 seconds for grafts. Okay. So I'm sure we'll do, you'll do lots of talks, I don't know whether you've had them already or we'll do them later, about prospective and retrospective gating. So in most centres now with the faster scanners, we default to prospective gating on, on all patients. So if we've got a heartbeat, heartbeat of less than 65 beats per minute, which is what we really want, we're going to be scanning through mid-diastole um, 70 to 80% of the cardiac interval. If the heart rate is a little bit higher than 65, um, but under 75, we may consider doing end systole because that's the next time where the vessels are nice and still. So we then might choose to scan between roughly 30 to 50 or 20 to 40, depending on the heart rate. And if the patient is above 75, but you still feel that it's steady and we can still do um, 
prospective, we might scan a little, a little larger range between 40 and 80. Retrospective. Very few centres now do retrospective with no modulation because it's very high dose to the patient. So in most cases, and for all our patients that we do retrospective scanning on, um, if their heart rate is above 70 to 75 beats per minute and it's varying, we might do end systole or end diastole depending on um, what we're trying to look for. So end diastole for most general coronaries, for TAVI or um, AVR assessment, we would probably scan through systole because we're looking for the annulus of the aortic valve, which is at its maximum diameter at about 30% of the R2R. So we tend to do systole for our TAVI and aortic valve patients. So we give beta blockers to the patient on the table if they haven't already had some outside. And um, we give IV metoprolol up to about 40 milligrams, isn't it? Yeah. And we usually, if they're suitable, for no contraindications, we will give 80, uh, 800 micrograms of GTM sublingually as well. And that's all administered by the supervising radiologist. Okay. So we want them to have a nice steady heart rate. We want ideally their heart rate to be below 65 beats a minute. We're going to do the breath hold exercise with them and make sure that the ECG is nice and still. They get a breath hold exercise as part of the scan protocol, um, which then synchronizes the ECG with the scanner. So the, the scanner will then pick up the ECG and work out what scanning protocol it feels it wants to do. So on our GE scanners, we have four modes that it can effectively pick. One is the um, prospective mode, and then there's three different types of retrospective mode, depending on, on how variable the heart rate is. So we're looking at heart rate and variability, whether we're going to do prospective or retrospective, whether we're going to put any padding on, whether the pitch is suitable. So I get that again, the pitch will depend on what type of retrospective mode we're going to pick, the tube rotation time and the reconstruction mode. So contrast timing. So we've talked about giving the contrast, but we need to time it correctly for the patient. So this will depend on your venous access and your venflon size and the flow rate and obviously the patient's cardiac output. There are two general methods of um, timing your contrast injection. One is test bolus, where you give the patient an extra injection, and one is bolus tracking, where you trigger um, when the house field unit is, is high enough to trigger the scan. So test bolus is a, a sort of injection of 20 mils of contrast followed by 20 mils of saline at the injection flow rate you're going to give the main bolus at, so five mils a second in most cases. The advantages of this is that you know the timing of the scan for that patient, it's very patient specific. So it takes into account their cardiac output um, and the patient also then knows what to expect from the injection. They've had a bit of contrast, they know what the hot flush feels like, they're prepared for the next injection. Also gives you any problems with the cannula before you start injecting your big bolus of contrast, okay? The limitations, obviously it's an extra step, so it takes a little bit more time and it means the patient has to receive that little bit extra contrast. Bolus tracking is where you set a, a region of interest in the vessel of interest, so um, it may, you may choose the descending or the ascending um, aorta. Um, so we choose ascending if we're going to bolus track the cardiacs, but we don't not to. And you set a Hounsfield limit for, th in which the region of interest will trigger the scan to start. So once the Hounsfield unit um, density reaches 150 in that region of interest, it'll trigger the scan to start. And so there'll be a bit of a delay, it'll then do a few monitoring slices and it'll continue to monitor until it triggers the scan and there'll be an inherent small delay, every system has one, it's usually about three seconds before it starts the scan. We now use test bolus, we used to use bolus tracking on the old Toshiba scanner um, because that's what worked better with that piece of equipment. We found with the new scanner that actually using the test bolus is better for us, for our cardiacs, although we do use bolus tracking for other arterial phase investigation. So you need to talk to your apps engineers, um, apps specialists on your particular models and work out what is best for your particular examination for your scanner. Okay. So the final check before we hit that scan button is you're going to warn the patient that the last scan is coming for them to continue to breathe as we've practiced all the way through. Not to move, they're going to get a hot flush for the injection. Make sure you've got a good ECG signal and a nice steady heart rate. And then you're going to start the contrast injection and the monitoring or acquisition simultaneously. When you start scanning, I sort of do a three point check. Patient's not screaming, contrast going in, we're getting images. Always a good start. 
Um, so you want to make sure that your ECG remains stable, that your patient's not distressed, they're not shouting out, they're not screaming, they haven't got a contrast extravasation, that they're able to follow the breathing instructions, and that as soon as the scan is acquired, you make sure you've covered the area of interest required and that you've got good contrast opacification. This is where your team of radiographers comes into its own. You need a good team of radiographers so that one person is scanning, checking all of this, then one person goes in and immediately checks on the patient. So the patient status is reassessed. So somebody goes in, checks the patient is okay, reassure them that the hot flash will wear off quickly, look for any immediate reactions to contrast, beta blockers or GTN. Are they feeling a bit faint? Has their blood pressure dropped? Are they looking clammy? Have they got a rash? Are they swelling up? Have they got any hives? If they're talking and, and chattering away and saying they're fine, then they're usually okay. Nausea is common, partly because most of the time you tell them not to have caffeine, so they go nil by mouth. You tell people not to drink certain things, they decide they can't have anything at all. And so they, they are nauseous because they're anxious and they may not have eaten anything. So the contrast injection will make them feel nauseous. That's quite a common one to do. If we've got good images obtained, we might keep the patient in the department for a while, depending on how they're feeling after the scan, depending on what protocol we've done. If we've given them quite a bit of contrast, so for our TAVI patients, our transplant patients that have had beta blockade, we keep in the department and monitor them up to an hour afterwards just to make sure they're okay. Um, but if they're fine and they're happy to go, then we can take the ECG off and remove their cannula. And before they leave the department, we inform them they can continue with normal activities. They can go away and have their cup of coffee and their cup of tea, their cigarette they've been desperate for for a few hours. But if they have had <coughs> IV beta blockade, depending on how much, we, are, we do ask all our patients to come with somebody. And it's ideal for them not to drive for a couple of hours afterwards, depending on how much beta blockade we've given them. <coughs> So the most important thing is to look for things like recognising breathing artefacts. So breathing during the scan can result in really poor image quality and there is not a lot you can do about it afterwards, which is why it's so important to practice with the patients first, because this is something you can do nothing about. So I think the bottom image shows <coughs> the best thing is you've got that lovely double hemidiaphragm on the left of the image there. There's nothing you can do to post-process that out. So the only solution is prevention. So it's assessing their breath holding capacity, breathing instructions, breathing exercise, and making sure the patient is relaxed and understands what they're doing. ECG editing is very specific to each scanner. So what we were able to do on our Toshiba scanner is a bit different to what we now do on our GE scanner. It's important for both the radiographers and the supervising radiologists to know what we can do on the scanner <laughs> afterwards. It can improve image quality. You can alter your ECG trace so you get good image quality, um, but ideally you, want, you don't want to be doing that unless you absolutely have to. The idea is to get it all set up beforehand. So we do a variety of reconstructions, post-processing reconstructions manually um, once the patient's coming off the table. So for all hearts, all native hearts, um, we do thin cuts, 0.5s on 0.3s or 0.625s in our case on um, through the cardiac phase if we've done padding then we do it through that full padding at a five percent interval if it's retrospective then we do it every ten percent through the area that we've scanned and obviously if we've done retrospective then we can do cardiac functional analysis where we do naught to ninety percent at ten percent intervals we always do a full chest just to look at the whole chest as well it's at either seventy five percent or thirty percent depending on whether we've done systole or diastole we send a copy of the ECG trace to PAC so the radiologist can see what the real ECG actually looked like and obviously a dose summary. Finally, the radiographer has to ensure that everything has been reconstructed as per the protocol. The images have been transferred to the appropriate workstations, so the workstations that you guys will use plus the PACs. Um, that the performer, we've probably talked about the performer already, is filled out so that the radiologist knows what's happened. We can comment on that if there's any mishaps, patient coughed during the scan, uh, didn't tolerate the contrast, whatever. Um, and complete all that, sign it off, and then the scan is complete. Thank you. Any questions?